statues and all kinds of things. He had everything money could buy. He had a son that he loved dearly, but his son died. And he was always broken up about that son. But he had an unfortunate that was painted for his son, and he hung it on the wall so he could see his son every day. And he put in his will, when he died, he had no relatives that he was attached to, to so it could be auctioned off. And he finally died, and they, they advertised this auction far and wide. People from all over the earth came for this auction. And the day of the auction, the auctioneer called the first thing up was the portrait of his son. And he says, this is a beautiful painting of this man's son, and we'll start out at $30,000 for it. <clears throat> Nobody offered anything. So the man finally went down to $1,000. <clears> he couldn't sell the painting for even $1,000. He went down to 500, 200, 100. And finally the butler said, I helped raise that young man. I loved him dearly. I have $10 in my pocket. If you'll give me that portrait for $10, I'd be happy to have it. And everyone said, give it to him, give it to him. Let's get that out of the way. We don't want that. We want the good stuff brought on. So the auctioneer said, go in once, go in twice, go in three times, sold to that man for $10. And then the auctioneer started packing up. And he says, bring on the good stuff. And he says, I can't. What I can't tell you is in that man's will, whoever loved my son enough to buy his portrait gets it all. So therefore, the auction is over. <clears throat> God had a son. He sent to this earth. He died for us. He became the perfect sacrifice for sin. Therefore, the sacrifice of bulls and goats and birds no longer was necessary because the perfect sacrifice was here. The Apostle Paul tells us that during his lifetime, he was called into the third heaven. Now, in that day and time, the first heaven was the atmosphere where the birds fly and the wind blows. The second heaven was where the moon, the stars, and the sun was. But that third heaven was where God lived. And the Apostle Paul, when he came back, he says, there's things in heaven I can't even imagine to tell you about. There's no words to explain what I saw. But if you follow Jesus, if you remember the sacrifice he gave for you, if you love him enough for what he did for you and turn your life over to him, God says you get it all. So we're here today to remember Jesus and the sacrifice he gave to us. He set up the Lord's Supper just so we can gather together to have fellowship with one another, to love one another, to love Jesus, and to remember the sacrifice that he gave for us. So would you please bow at this time. Father, we're so thankful for Jesus, the Son of God, that he came to this earth, that he loved us so much, that he died for us, that he became the perfect sacrifice and prepared a way for us to enter into his heaven and to live with him and his father. Be with us now as we take of this bread, which represents the broken body of Christ, and as we take of the fruit of the vine, which represents the blood of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. While Dave's doing that, I'm going to go ahead and get started. I, I brought my lunch because it was going to be a really long sermon, but I see we're short on time.
Oh, yeah, and I get to take my mask off. Thanks for reminding me, Steve. Yay. There's my clicker. So last week, uh, we began talking about uh, his story. And we wanted to uh, try to point out that there's a, a, a competing narrative that wants to make his story our story. And we've sort of taken God out of the center of the story, and we've put ourselves in. And uh, this week, I saw an example of that on, uh, or at least I listened to an example. Jill likes to watch this show. It's a talk show on Facebook. I don't know if you know they had these. I didn't. But it's called the Red Table Talk. I don't know if anybody watches that or listens to it. But it's Jada Pinkett Smith, Will Smith's uh, wife, and, and her daughter, Willow, and then I think Willow's grandmother. And they have guests on, and they talk about different social issues of the day. And this time, uh, this week, Willow brought up her choice for uh, polyamory, or she was she thought herself as polyamorous, and uh, which which means that she's decided to be in multiple intimate relationships, and that everybody in those relationships agree uh, that that's okay with everybody in the group. And so, uh, and she says this about it. She says, with polyamory, I feel like the main foundation is the freedom to be able to create a relationship style that works for you, and not just stepping into monogamy because that's what everyone around you says is the right thing to do. And so Jada, her mom, said that her and Will Smith had decided to honor God with monogamy, but that she understands that whatever Willow chooses or whatever anyone chooses uh, shouldn't be because anyone told them to, but because it was their choice. Now, I'm happy she defended monogamy. I'm happy she defended honoring God in her marriage situation. That's all good. I don't have too much of a problem with the idea that you can't force somebody to honor God with their life. You can't force that. So I get that. And so the idea that you, as long as nobody told you to, that, that's the part I just want to do some separating. If, if we're just talking about somebody here on earth, and, and that they're trying to make you do something, great. I, stand up for yourself and, and go the way you think you should go if people are trying to force you. But the thing is, there's someone higher than this earth. There's still a voice higher than this earth. And if we're saying nobody can tell me what to do, including God, this is where I think there's a problem. And this is, this is one of the ways that uh, we see this, this mentality. I, last week I, I talked about moralistic therapeutic deism, which is basically centers around the central goal in life is that I'm happy. That's, that's the center. It's all about me. And so I, I want to continue to talk about this today, how man fits into his story, into God's story. I didn't call this the story of man because then I'm putting the focus on us and I'm trying not to do that. I'm, I'm trying to keep this series uh, focused on the fact that it's God's story, and this is how things fit into it. And I want to talk today about how man fits into it. And so when we, when we did God's story, we went back to the beginning, back to Genesis, and, and looked for what God was doing. Try to start there. That's a good place to start. And I want to do that today as well. I want to look at Genesis for, for God's intention in mankind. But before I do that, I have to, I have to say, whenever we go to the creation narrative of Genesis, uh, how many of us have asked these kinds of questions? Where did Cain get his wife? Or Seth, for that matter. Uh, who was Cain afraid of when God was sending him away? Was everything created in six literal days? How was there evening and morning before the sun, moon, and stars were created on fourth day? Where are the dragons? Mentioned in Genesis 121, if you read the Hebrew, Hatananim, dragons. And was there literally a talking steak, a snake, a talking steak, if you like that kind of meat? Um, was there a literal talking snake? Uh, you know, these questions I've asked of myself, curious, curiosity, that's fine. It's okay. We're trying to understand the story. We're looking for all the information. That part's fine. But there is a danger when we approach the text, if we're going there and we're saying, God, I'm demanding that you answer my questions. Does anybody know what I mean? Like if these kinds of questions are putting God on trial and his word on trial and, and they cause divisions and fighting among us because we're trying to have answers to these kind of questions. These questions originate in us. 
There are questions. And so curious as they may be, and go ahead and ask them in that way. But, but when we go to the Bible, the center of our intention has to be, God, what are you trying to say to me? If we're, if we're not doing that, we're still putting ourselves in the center of the story. Do we get that? God has to be in the center of the story. And, and when we go to his word, we're saying, God, open my eyes to what you need me to see. The rest can come later or whenever. But, but first and foremost, I need to know what you are trying to communicate. This keeps God in the center. And so when we look at the creation narrative and we see what God was doing, this is our primary goal. We see that God does an amazing thing for humanity. Listen, the, the Genesis narrative overall, it's saying, the creation narrative is saying, God is good. God created everything good. He created you to be good. In fact, he saw everything he made and he called it what? Very good. Very good. <clears throat> God, God did an amazing thing. And we have to understand when he did that, there was also a competing narrative out there. Just like there is today, there's a competing narrative, and Genesis still speaks to it, but there was a competing narrative then, too. And in the world, the, the, I, one of the ideas of sort of the creation of man is the battle between uh, uh, Marduk, I think, and Tiamat, and these two gods. It's like the salt water and fresh water fighting. It's weird. But anyway, the gods fought, and Tiamat lost, and... And then some other lesser god of Tiamat got slaughtered over that. The blood of Tiamat, out of that was made humanity as slaves in the lowest position to do the menial tasks of the, of the gods and of the temples of the gods. That's humanity. Slaves, menial tasks, lowest position serving the gods and, and the temples of the gods. That's the competing narrative. Humanity. But when we look at God's narrative, the Hebrew narrative of who God is. We don't see that at all. We see God elevating man, as I said last week, that we live to glorify God, and by doing that, we live a glorious life. That's what we're going to see in the Genesis narrative. So I want to take a look at this. In the beginning, God created man, and he created man, and he gave him five things, I want to say. Maybe there's more. Maybe I missed some, but here's five I see. He gave him the highest place. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and then skip down to the... So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. I'll get back to that middle part. So God creates man in the highest. It's not the lowest slave under everything, menial. No, God gives mankind the highest place over, over all creation, and he calls him to live in God's image, to be God's ambassadors, his emissaries, to represent God over all things on earth. The highest place only under God. But over everything else. That's, that's the Hebrew narrative. Competing narrative with what's out there. And then he gave him a holy purpose. In the next verse, so it kind of repeats the middle part we just didn't, didn't read. And God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now listen, that, that's a holy purpose, to fill the earth with humanity in God's image and to rule over the earth in God's image. That's the important part. Amen. It's the holy purpose is, is not that mankind uh, do, ha, dominate the earth in a way that says, me, 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 mine, 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 get, get, get. It's in the image of God that man is supposed to have dominion. What is the image of God? People argue and fight about this a lot. Listen, at very least, let me say, simply, if you want to know the image of God, look at Jesus. In Colossians 1, it says, he is the image of the invisible God. There's his image. Hebrews 1 says, the Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of God's being. What's God's image? Look at Jesus. I don't think he was saying he was a five foot nine Jewish man with dark hair and dark eyes. I don't think that's what it means, right? What does the image of God mean? It means the nature and the character, the loving, the serving, the giving, the caring God. That's who God is. That's God's image. And when we look back at Genesis and we see that we were created to be in God's image and rule over the earth, 
It's like Jesus would do it. This is the highest calling and the highest uh, uh, place and the holy purpose that God has given us. Way different than the narrative out there. And then he gave us a healthy provision. And so here's the verse in Genesis 129. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. This will be yours for food. Listen, I prefer Noah's menu and even Jesus' menu when the disciples said, this is how he declared all foods clean, okay? I like that menu. But I am amazed, and here's where I brought my lunch. I am amazed at what God had done in giving that food. You say, well, what about protein? How are you going to eat protein? Anybody ever eat this bread? Anybody know this bread? Just a couple of you, some of you? Ezekiel 4, 9 bread. It's just amazing stuff. If you didn't think the Bible was cool before, these are the kind of things that just make it, you know, all the more cool. 2,600-year-old recipe. Steve Creighton has some dough. I think it's uh, still running from like 500 years ago. A little piece that his family has handed down. He'll make you wonderful bread out of it. But 2,600-year-old recipe. I don't know if it's 500 years old, but it's old, right, Steve? 2,600-year-old recipe. And you know what's cool about this bread? It, the verse says, take also unto thee wheat, barley, beans, lentils, millet, and spelt. Put them in one vessel and make bread out of it. Here's what they discovered. When these six gra- grains and legumes are sprouted and combined, an amazing thing happens. A complete protein is created that closely parallels the protein in milk and eggs. In fact, the quality is so high that it's 84.3% as efficient as the highest recognized source of protein, containing all nine essential amino acids. There are 18 amino acids present in this unique bread, all from vegetable sources naturally balanced. 2,600 years ago, when they didn't know anything about proteins and amino acids, I think, (laughs) right? This is God's bread. Now, why was that important? Listen, God told Ezekiel to lay on his thigh for 14 months, 390 days on one side, 40 on the other, to show how long Israel's been in rebellion. It's a judgment against Jerusalem and saying it's going to be attacked. But he couldn't just have normal food. He couldn't make normal food. He had to spend most of his time just laying there. What was he going to do? This bread sustained him all that time. It had everything he needed. Isn't that amazing? Can I get an amen on that? <laughs> I mean, it's just so, so healthy provision. Uh, if, if we had to, we could certainly live a healthy diet on just the stuff there in the Genesis narrative, in the Genesis phase narrative. So I find that amazing. And, and it's not just that. God gave them all of the beautiful fruit-bearing plants. He gave them all, you know, security and safety and free reign in that garden. It's like, thank you, God, right? Can we say thank you, Jesus? How many, of us are, how many of us are thankful for food, all the variety of flavors and textures and colors? And Isn't that amazing? This is the God of the Bible. Different narrative out there. And then he gave us a heavenly partnership. And here the men who are married should say, amen. Or get in trouble. <laughs> he gave us a heavenly partnership. And the women should say it too, but it just turns out in the text it's sort of the man and, uh, sorry, I hit play. Okay, so it says, the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I'll make a helper fit for him. That's why I said every man should say, amen, right? So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up the place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, woo! He really did. That's in the Hebrew. He said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Now, the reason why I highlighted those words right there, uh, the reason why I put those in there and put the little note, listen, the, the word, the Hebrew word for rib in this passage is in the Hebrew Bible 41 times. Nowhere else is it translated rib. Nowhere. Nobody ever says it's rib. Everywhere else, it's just translated thigh, or a version of saying a thigh or something. But never rib. (laughs) So if we were to translate this the way it's translated everywhere else in the Bible, it would say God put him to sleep and took one of his sides, and from that side created the woman. And the imagery is like God pulled humanity apart. 
in, in sort of differing complexities, male and female. And then there's this message that when male and female come back together to become one, this is sort of the ideal for God, for humanity. And this is how they will fulfill their purpose, their, their holy purpose, their heavenly purpose on earth. Bringing this back together. And the Bible talks about this union of bringing male and female back together as a mystery related to how God and man are reconciled. Do we know this? Have we seen this in our Bible? The, the, the church, the, the, the bride and the groom, the church and Jesus sort of married. And this is a mystery of marriage. Have you seen that? And I'll tell you my own thoughts about that. It seems to me that when a, when a, when a man, when a male can cross the huge gulf to understand a female. Can I get an amen? When a male can do that, not project maleness onto the female so that there's all kind of conflict and no understanding, but when a male can understand female and build that relationship, and when a female can understand male, is that easy, female? But when she can, and she can cross over that gulf and not project female onto the male, but try to understand where the male's coming from when she can do that. And they, and they find a way to have a relationship with a holy, otherworldly being. When they can do that, it's sort of a training ground for having a relationship with God. So that we don't project ourselves onto God and then think about God like us. Somebody said, God created man uh, in his own image and he quickly returned the favor. You get that? Man quickly returned the favor. Began to create God in his image. Get it? We can't do that. That's not how to have a relationship with God. We have to understand he is a completely other being, holy being. He's different from us. We can't project ourselves onto him and try to understand him. We have to come to him to try to understand him from what he's giving. And so that's why this, this tearing apart and reunifying is this sort of holy thing, this heavenly thing, because it represents reconciliation between man and God. And so he's given all those things. Highest place, holy purpose, healthy provision, heavenly partnership, and then a harsh prohibition. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat it. For in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now, I want to say here, the provision itself, I mean, I, I said this a little bit wrong. It's not the provision that's harsh. It's not really the provision, uh, it's not really the prohibition that's harsh. The prohibition is simple. Just don't eat that fruit, right? It's... It's the punishment in the prohibition that seems kind of harsh. Okay? You, you ate a pe the wrong fruit. Bam, you're out of here. Seems kind of harsh. It's just a piece of fruit. But is it? Is it really harsh? I want to illustrate this or try to help uh, illustrate this with the story of the Disney uh, anime classic Frozen. Some of you may recognize this scene. I don't know if you can see it very well. The, the lighting doesn't really bring it out that well. But some of you may recognize this scene where uh, Elsa throws up her glove. Anybody recognize this? If I started singing Let It Go, how many people would just bust out in song here? It's an iconic song, right? You probably heard it a thousand times. Um, but here she sings this song, and when she takes off this glove, she's, she's kind of throwing off the rule her father had placed on her. She throws off this rule, and she says, no right, no wrong, no rules for me. I'm free. And she becomes this Elsa who's just free to just use all her power however she wants. And this week as I was studying on this and, and preparing for this lesson, I, I came across there are preachers who will call this song uh, disgusting and demonic and all kinds of things. And I remember when I heard it, I thought, yeah, that's not really what I want my kids singing, right? No right, no wrong, no rules for me. But I want to tell you, I think the song is perfect in its context. I think it's perfect. Not that the message is one we want, but the song is perfect in the context of the story that Disney is telling. Because when Elsa makes the decision to throw off the rule of her father, the rule that was supposed to protect her and her family and her neighbors and her community and her world, when she throws off that rule, there are consequences. Right? 
Anybody remember this scene? Elsa, uh, Anna has come to confront Elsa about what's happening. Elsa doesn't know what's happening. But, but Elsa says, look, I'm going to just be me. Stay away, and you'll be safe from me. Do you remember this scene, anybody? And then Anna, Anna says, actually, we're not. <laughs> right? And then Elsa says, uh, Elsa says, what do you mean you're not? And she says, I get the feeling you don't know. And she says, what do I not know? And then Anna says, Arendelle's in deep, 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 deep snow. What you've, your freedom to do whatever you want, no right, no wrong, no rules, has caused like everything to be destroyed, even the economy. You can't sell ice in July anymore, right? If you know the story. So, so this is like the Genesis story. When, when humanity decided to throw off the rule of its father, no right, no wrong, no rules for me, I'm going to do what I want to do, all of this chaos ensued. Sin and death was brought into the world. So it's not a harsh prohibition if you think about it this way. I, when I said, well, it was just a piece of fruit. That's right, think about that. It was just a piece of fruit. It, it could have been an apple, a pomegranate, an avocado, or a fig. It doesn't matter. It's just a piece of fruit. That fruit, passion fruit, ha <laughs> ha, that fruit could have been the same exact fruit on every other tree around it. The, the fruit on the tree in the center of the garden could have been the exact same apple or pomegranate on that tree over there and that tree over there. Could have been exactly the same. doesn't matter. It's not the fruit. It wasn't like poisonous fruit that hurt the bodies or something. They didn't die in that way. And so you're right, it was just a piece of fruit. Yeah, but think about the implications of that. It was just a piece of fruit. They weren't being denied anything. They, they didn't lack anything. They had all the fruit they needed, even of that kind, I think. They had all the freedom. They had all the garden, the paradise. They had everything. What do they need that piece of fruit for? It was just a piece of fruit. Here's the thing. The center of the garden, God says, well, that belongs to me. That's my place. That's not yours. You've got to make a choice. I've put you over all things, but still under me. You've got to acknowledge that if you're going to experience the paradise of God. That's still true today. We have got to acknowledge the center belongs to God. When they said, no, I'm going to eat this fruit, it was the choice they were making. To say, even that spot is mine. And you cannot have the paradise of God. He doesn't even have to kick them out, really. I mean, he does, but he doesn't have to. When we deny God's place in the center of our lives, we're basically kicking ourselves out. We cannot experience his blessings when we fail to acknowledge him. And so I want to leave you with this. I, a few months ago, I asked you to learn to, to quote uh, 1 Thessalonians, Thessalonians, when I was going through that, that, uh, that, those two chapters, those two books. Do you remember what I asked you to quote? 1 Thessalonians 5.23. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless on the coming of our Lord Jesus. The one who called you is faithful, and he'll do it. Such a great passage. It, it's, it's all on God. If you'll put your trust in him, he'll take care of it. That's what it says. But in order to combat that other narrative out there that wants us to put ourselves in the center and kick God out, you need, we all need to memorize this passage. You may already have it. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways. Acknowledge or submit to him, and he will direct your paths. Learn to quote that this week. Come on, you did it in PGMB, some of you. Or your kids did it, so you can do it too. You can learn to memorize this verse and do it because you want that scripture flowing through your mind, reminding you. God has given you all this tremendous blessing, but it only comes when we acknowledge him. We pray with me. Father, open our eyes to your presence in the center of our paradise, that, that you belong in the center of his story. You are. It's your story, not ours. And Father, help us to understand that's the ideology of those we seek to, to bring the gospel to. And give us words to be able to point people to you, to, to put you in the center, how, however we may do that. And, and help us to model that in our own lives, that no matter what, we trust.
trust you, we acknowledge you every day. I pray this in Jesus' name. James says that uh, he's taking a group down to Cynthia Guerrero July 10 through the 16th. <laughs> I got that right. Uh, so if you have an interest in doing that, um, I don't know what projects they're going to be working on, uh, but if you have an interest, talk to James about that. Uh, Brenda Bellanis asks also that we remember her and her daughter Bernadette. Uh, they're having some health issues. I don't know what specifically. I know that Brenda's had some, some chronic issues. Uh, but I, don't, I didn't see any specifics in the bulletin, so I don't know what to tell you. Let's, uh, let's pray. Father, it is a, um, it is such a privilege to, to be able to come into relationship with you, to draw near to you, and that as we draw near to you, you draw near to us because of Jesus. That at any time, we can reach out to you and um, 
and be close to you because of the blood on the cross. Father, thank you that, that you have given us a life in this life and a life that's, that's to be immortal, a life that doesn't just end. We, we long for relationships. And when we lose relationships, it, it just feels like it's, it's, it just tears our hearts apart. But there's something in us that wants every relationship to be held, to never lose hold of. And that's what makes our hope so complete. That the relationships that we've lost here will be gained again. We also long for justice because you long for justice. And Father, we know that, that uh, in the end you will make everything right. That all the things that are broken here on earth, all the things that occupy our time, that you will make right. Thank you, Father, that you have uh, given us a hope, that you have given us a purpose, that you have called us to bring your kingdom into other people's lives, into the lives of families in Vincente Guerrero, and the lives of our neighbors, and the lives of our communities, and the lives of our families that you have given us a great purpose. We are to be your ambassadors, ambassadors of the kingdom of God. Father, forgive us for all the sins that we know we commit. And forgive us of all the sins we haven't a clue that we commit. And draw us close to each other and close to you. In your son's blessed name, amen. Is there a um, passage? Okay, you're dismissed. <laughs>